I've always been fascinated by the creative process and by the role of design thinking in breakthrough scientific discovery and also in technological innovation. How do we come up with new ideas? The origin and evolution of life are preeminent exemplars of the origin of novelty, from which we can learn a lot about creativity in general and our own creative methods as problem solvers. Though I started by translating from evolution to understand our own creative process, I eventually realized that there was an even more intriguing translation in the other direction. Principles of design could shed light on the process of evolution. I believe that understanding evolution is necessary to protect the future of life on Earth. New Year 2009 initiated a big anniversary year, the 150th anniversary of Darwin's publication of Origin of Species and the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth. The old debate between Darwinists and intelligent designers is dead. No matter how hard they fight, neither will concede that they agree on the most important point. For both, Life is completely passive, whether designed by external random variation and external environmental selection, or by an external intelligent designer. Neither Darwinists nor intelligent designers give any credit to life itself. So that's the real debate. Was life just passive, driven solely by random mutation and environmental selection? Or was life a pattern recognizer, recognizing when a random variation fit and could be the next evolutionary innovation? Suppose the term design connotes not just intelligent design top down by an intelligent designer, but rather how life itself, through recognizing patterns from within, can design itself bottom up. On the question of whether life was a passive or active player in evolution. Intelligent design and Darwinism sit together on the same side of the table. Both assume that life was passive. What Daedalus told Darwin was that there is a third option, where life is active, where collaboration and competition are co-equal, complementary dynamics in the process of evolution. Beyond the debate lies another question. Does Darwinism perhaps misrepresent Darwin? Harvard biologist and Darwin scholar, the late Stephen Jay Gould, thought that Darwinism did misrepresent Darwin. He wrote, Darwin lived to see his name expropriated for an extreme view that he never held. For Darwinism has often been defined both in his day and in our own, as the belief that virtually all evolutionary change is a product of natural selection. If Gould was right that Darwinism misrepresented Darwin, there are large implications. Powerful cultural lenses focus Darwin's theory, molding how it was interpreted. Stephen Jay Gould proposed that we could view our interpretation of evolution as an extended analogy to Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, published in 1776 when the American Revolution was in full swing. The context was ripe to receive Adam Smith's thoughts on economic freedom, self-interest, division of labor, function of markets, and the benefits of laissez-faire capitalism. Adam Smith, with the publication of Wealth of Nations, launched economics as a separate discipline and seeded the economic doctrine of free enterprise. Examining the cultural lens through which Darwin's theory of evolution was institutionalized as Darwinism raises questions about two traditional assumptions. First, we typically note scientific precursors for the theory of evolution but we tend to neglect the socioeconomic precursors. Herbert Spencer, who coined the phrase survival of the fittest, was working on his own theory before Charles Darwin published Origin of Species in 1859. Helped to mold the cultural lens through which Darwin's theory was interpreted as 
competition for survival of the fittest, then convention is turned on its head. Typically assume that science comes first to formulate theories which social science adapts and translates. That social Darwinism was merely a derivative of Darwinism. But here, a socioeconomic system promoting competition and self-interest may have preceded and molded Darwinism in its own image. Our second assumption is that scientists are dispassionate observers of the truth. But if so, why do Darwinists defend their belief with the impassioned fervor of religious zealots? Why, when some question evidence and find contradictions, are they shot down with such unscientific vehemence? The fervor of Darwinists suggests that evolution has been anthropomorphized in our own image, that Darwinism has become a new religion, reigning supreme as a dogma. No questions allowed. Religion and politics both engender passion. Darwinism appeals to both. Darwinism justifies those in power as having survived and prevailed because they are fittest. Natural law has selected them as fitting to rule. Darwinism justified the rise of capitalism and industrialism in the late 19th century. But this is now the 21st century. 150 years have passed since Darwin published Origin of Species, an interpretation of Darwin's theory that suited early industrialism no longer suits us now. Rates of extinction are soaring threatening the web of life on Earth, the biodiversity that sustains farming, forestry, and our oceans. Each year, as many as 50,000 species go extinct, many because of human activity. In 1968, Garrett Hardin published his classic in the journal Science, showing that Darwinist survival of the fittest logic leads to the tragedy of the commons. For example, if every fisherman competing for survival of the fittest buys more and more boats, better and better technology in order to catch more and more fish, then this collective behavior of all fishermen competing with each other for survival of the fittest can fish out our ocean resources, leaving no fish for anyone. This is the tragedy of the commons. The survival of the fittest principle leads ultimately to our own destruction. The tragedy of the commons plays out not only in the resources that we collectively exploit, but in the damages that we collectively inflict on the environment. By questioning the logic of competition for survival of the fittest, which may make our planet Earth unsustainable, the tragedy of the commons calls for a more complete interpretation of Darwin's theory of evolution. What Daedalus told Darwin is that this more complete interpretation of the theory of evolution would elevate collaboration to a co-equal stature with competition. We easily accept the complementarity of left brain thinking analytic, competitive, linear thinking, and right brain thinking, which is synthetic, collaborative, web-like, as the way that our own brains work, wouldn't it be logical that evolution, which invented our brains, might embed a similar complementarity in its own dynamics? If so, then competition for survival of the fittest would describe only half of evolution. The other neglected right brain half is represented by the theories on the right hand side of this chart. Most of us have forgotten that Adam Smith wrote not just Wealth of Nations, but a companion volume, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, published in 1759, exactly 100 years before Darwin published Origin of Species. Adam Smith intended that the two volumes should be read together that the competitive self-interest view of wealth of nations should be complemented by morality and compassion. Evolution has moved beyond the halls of academia into our everyday lives.